we are recording. And for starters, if you don't mind, give me your name, spelling of your name, and then the title that you'd like to see uh, on the newscast. All right, absolutely. Um, it's Chris, C-H-R-I-S, Pruting, P-R-U-E-T-T-I-N-G. I am a uh, Senior Director of Strategic Operations in Qualcomm Government Technologies Group here at Qualcomm. Great. Um, well, I, I saw this described as the next Wright Brothers moment as we uh, expect a, you know, this a helicopter to lift off on Mars. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, absolutely. So this has been several years in the making and um, the visionaries there at JPL were really committed to leveraging commercial technologies in order to achieve this mission. Quite frankly, back in 2014, this was an easy choice for them to make because the traditional technologies of NASA and um, um, the US government in general just weren't gonna cut it for this very small, less than four pound uh, helicopter that was gonna take a ride on Perseverance up into Mars. And so they had to find some alternative ways to, to kind of deal with the technology aspects of what NASA dubs, and this is key, as a technology demonstrator. That is the same thing they called Soldier back in the late 1990s when the first rover was sent up to Mars. And so the expectation here isn't the traditional scientific mission. It's really just a technology proof of concept, a demonstration capability for them to move forward. For them to achieve that though, they had several challenges they had to overcome, which was how do you fly on Mars? And so the previous rover missions were able to collect enough information that we have a pretty good understanding of what the atmosphere, the gravity, you know, a whole host of factors that might come into play on Mars and how to adapt to those technologies was really what predicated this more commercial off the shelf based solution because um, key in the um, NASA and JPL world nowadays is autonomy. We can't really fly by stick um, uh, going into something like this. Currently, there's about a 13 minute delay one way for signals to get, get to Mars and signals get back. And so just flying by, you know, you and I on, on Earth here trying to fly with a, a remote drone just is impossible. And so a lot of what they had to, you know, part of that Wright brother moment is how are we gonna fly in this other place? What is the technology solution that's gonna take there? And how do we adapt all the knowledge that we have as JPL and work with the industry in a way that will help us get to where we need to go? Um, in our industry, we often we talk about size, weight, and power. And um, the size had to be small, the weight had to be low, and the power draw on this thing had to be so small because there just isn't enough room for a large amount of batteries. Think of it like cell phone batteries on the helicopter. And those batteries, actually its prime mission is to keep the electronics warm overnight, you know, first and foremost above even the flight. And then it has to have enough power left in order to fly. So when you start adding those things together back in 2014, 2015 timeframe, the only things that could really do that were the cell phones that we were carrying around in our pockets. We're kind of used to having those things last an entire day. There's a reason that happens that our company, our DNA is really about creating these solutions in a very low power way so that we can have nice big displays, um, operate in a form factor that makes sense for our hand, and then take that to the next level and really adapt those technologies to these alternative markets, in this case, like drones and, and robotics. And although we've been very successful with now drones and robotics in a, a internet of things type space and in the Roombas and other things out there, um, to have that then adapted to a mission to Mars is obviously um, quite inspirational for the folks at Qualcomm uh, working through that as well as JPL. And the, I think the, the Wright brother moment not only is in the first flight per se, but how we got there in a way that was very collaborative with the folks at JPL um, to go through that. And so mirroring our best capabilities and our, our engineering know-how with their engineering know-how is really what I think got us to this point to be able to ensure that we could, with some confidence, be able to say, we're going to make it on the, you know, this first flight uh, coming this Sunday night. I remember in the first interview with Qualcomm uh, discussing uh, for Perseverance that you were basically providing the brains 
to the operation. Uh, what, what would you describe that you're providing to um, the ingenuity? Uh, so the, the, they call it the heart and the brain of ingenuity. The, the key aspect, there are five boards inside of the little package you see there. Um, the one called Qualcomm Flight is really driving everything inside that package um, going forward. The flight algorithms are utilizing the, um, uh, the various sensors we have on board, accelerometers and such. We're utilizing, we have four cameras on board, for example. One of those cameras is downward facing. So we take the information uh, to try to determine where we are in three-dimensional space this way, up, um, up and down. And we're trying to, in a very quick fashion, determine where we are so that if we were, for example, get blown off course, we immediately readjust back to that position that we're supposed to be. Because in our world, the flight commands are given and packaged up the night before. And once that flight is started, then the uh, ingenuity has to make some autonomous corrections as part of it. The autonomy is what is key here um, in order to allow that flight to happen. And this is what Qualcomm's gotten very good at over the years. Um, the board solution that we have there is our first generation. And Dave Singh would tell you, we're currently on our fifth generation of that processor. And what gets us excited in QGO for Qualcomm government technologies is having the government leverage not only a technology at a point in time, but leverage that roadmap. So over time, it can pick and choose the technologies it wants to use for that next mission that gets all the goodness from companies like Qualcomm and quite frankly, the ecosystem that we're, we're supporting and all those great uh, advances that are being made they kind of get those for free and use that as their starting point. And that's evolving year over year, as opposed to maybe a traditional defense or NASA cycle every 20 years or generation creating new technology solutions. I remember they were describing the, what was it? The eight seconds of terror as the Perseverance was going to land on Mars. Will there be something similar like that as, as uh, Ingenuity is ready to take off? You know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure there will be. So, um, with us, they've been testing things all along the way since last Saturday when um, Ingenuity came off Perseverance. And so behind the scenes, there's a lot of telemetry data that says everything is working out exactly as planned. The batteries are staying charged. We have every confidence. They just did a, a rotor test last night at um, 50, what they call 50 RPM. So not that fast, but enough to at least prove that it can accept commands to start the rotor it can then run the rotor and send all that data back to Earth and let us analyze that. And so, um, you know, I, I think uh, everything's set in a, a good place, but of course we'll be doing some nail biting up until the moment uh, 13 minutes will pass before we know that it actually happened. That's slated and you've probably seen to be um, 3.30 a.m. Eastern time um, based on Mars time or on Mars, it'll be roughly 12.30 in the afternoon um, there. So at that point, and that's uh, 12.30 p.m. Uh, a.m., sorry, sorry, Monday morning um, here on the West Coast to for us to watch and see that telemetry data coming back. And I, again, there'll be a, a delay of, you know, 10, about 13 to 20 minutes while that data is being processed. So we'll be anxiously awaiting kind of what, what happens there. So um, that, uh, call it your, your 13 minutes of terror uh, as we're waiting, kind of we know that the flight's supposed to go off because we've pro, pro, pre-programmed through JPL's instructions uh, the, the exact time that it'll fly. And by the way, that time's picked because it, the batteries, remember, have to warm up the electronics at night. And so they have to get enough charge in the morning to recover from that fly and then get enough charge back into the battery so it can survive the next Martian night. So I would expect that over the, the course of these 30 days and these five flights, it'll be these mid-afternoon kind of flight times just to kind of honor where the, the battery life's gonna to have to be on this um, thing for those 30 days. Is all the technology in that's packed in this, that's already there, right? There's no adjustments you can make. I mean, your work is done, right? It's now just to see if it happens. 
Uh, you know, it's uh, at that point, it's a bit, it's a bit of software. And so, yes, our, our work is done from that perspective, but the amount of data that will be coming back is really what's going to inform the future missions for, for NASA in general here, whether it's a, you know, bigger, better drones to do more scientific missions or a swarm of drones that help, you know, let's say map a landscape versus the current uh, rover missions tend to move uh, slowly over the terrain because quite frankly, it has to navigate things like rocks and um, uh, cliffs and things like that. With the drones, the original name given to uh, the helicopter was scout. How do you scout, provide that recognizance data so that the rover can plan its next day emissions? And how can eventually the uh, ingenuity or these helicopters actually produce scientific results with, um, as our industry is getting um, better and better, the scientific instruments are actually getting smaller and smaller and they can benefit from kind of this low power way of doing things. And so we're excited about where things can go. And again, as opposed to getting fixated at a point in time, when we're talking about the fifth generation and the next time, maybe the sixth generation, the seventh, these things are getting smaller, lighter, faster, and smarter based on, you know, key in our industry right now is artificial intelligence. And when you look at where NASA and JPL want to go over the next 10 years, just about everything there is about autonomy. The more uh, autonomous the solutions are, the more processing at the edge. If I can do things on the moon and in Mars without having to send all that data back to Earth, how much more they can get in understanding what's really going on there and kind of make these big, bold discoveries. And you know, their big goal here is to discover life in, in other areas and other planets and other moons. I understand the first flight is just supposed to be 10 feet or three meters and hovering for about 30 seconds. What is the potential for later flights? So in total, they will have five flights and it's not likely to go much past that um, uh, going into it. It is likely that instead of just going up, it will start to go out in a, um, into the area and start following these wave waypoints that are pre-programmed in. And the goal with the, um, the um, sensors and the camera on board is to start and land in the same spot. And so that's really gonna be key to um, all this. The um, ingenuity with the power that they've kind of programmed in there is expected to fly only up to about 90 seconds. And that's really what's gonna prove the flight. And so there's only so much you can do in about that 90 seconds, but there are some interesting stuff in the area. It's likely to stay it's currently in an area called the airfield, 10, 10 meter by 10 meter. But the 10 meter by 10 meters in, in inside something about the size of a football field. And so it could theoretically go anywhere um, in that area, which uh, the Perseverance is already deemed flat enough for flight um, to do some more interesting things. Likely what I'll do is just uh, do a series of maneuvers, take some pictures, and then try to come back to the same spot. and. Quite frankly, they'll have they'll have success on that first flight. Anything above that is just um, kind of gravy. Uh, so big giant contribution from uh, Qualcomm and in, in uh, the San Diego area. Um, what will you? How how and you know what will you your local group be doing? Uh, you know at the time of this liftoff, where will you be? What do you, what do you, how are you going to watch? Uh, I will be watching with the JPL engineers that made this all happen. They've opened up a portal for us to do that. Um, to my wife's chagrin, it's at 1130 at night, all the way till two in the morning. So, um, we'll see how that goes. Um, we do have some shirts to kind of commemorate the first flight and we'll all be wearing our shirts, uh, as part of that, really looking forward to it. And, you know, uh, for all of us, we're so excited about what's going on. The time, time doesn't really matter, but you're right. Uh, this, this technology was invented. This technology was designed and developed, uh, the technology we call Qualcomm flight the board that's inside both the Ingenuity, and by the way, there's a second Qualcomm flight on Mars. It's in a small box called the base station, the back of Perseverance, um, because Ingenuity doesn't have the ability to send all that data back to uh, the Mars orbiter, back to Earth by itself. Um, this really is to test flight, not to necessarily the communication link. And so they have a short range communication from Ingenuity back to Perseverance. Perseverance will store those photos in another Qualcomm flight board and then package those up to send back to the earth. And likewise, all the commands that are coming to Ingenuity are coming through Perseverance and the Qualcomm flight in there. 
Uh, and in addition to that, we manufactured the boards here in San Diego as well as for our engineering crew. And then from the for the product phase that ultimately JPL did buy for the um, for the Ingenuity and Rover mission and the Perseverance mission. Well, a big giant success, no matter what happens uh, early Monday, but congratulations to your team. And I, I got a million more questions for you, but but I got to get going and, and, and you, you provided plenty. So thank you very much. Uh, appreciate it, Chris, and uh, good luck. All right. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. It's nice meeting you.